Hello everyone and welcome to TFYLP, Transformers for Your Listening Pleasure, episode number 280, recorded March 3rd, 2018. I am your host, Drawn Land, a.k.a. Weird Wolf. Along with me this evening is Headmaster Dawn. Hey everybody. Jim Black. Hello. And your sexy voice again. <laughs> I know, right? The sexy radio voice. <laughs> and joining us once again, uh, a man that needs, needs no introduction, Mr. Aaron Archer. Welcome back to TFYLP. Hey, glad to be here. <laughs> um, this is, uh, as I mentioned on last week's episode, this is a pre-recorded episode, uh, largely in part because my computer is just not, uh, with recent updates and everything, is just not able to broadcast live. So until I'm able to get a computer that is... Uh, able to do so uh, we're going to do the pre-record uh, temporarily this seems to be working fine um, so we're going to do that that is part of the reason why we're pre-recording another reason we're pre-recording is that uh, as this airs I am currently at Lexington Comic Con uh, in Lexington Kentucky so if you are in that area today uh, please uh, drop by and check us out at the Captured Prey booth I believe we'll be on the second floor of that one. Um, it is a huge show, thousands of attendants. Uh, I know uh, Chuck Norris is uh, scheduled to be here, and uh, um, lots of Power Ranger guests, uh, lots of... Well, allow me to correct you. Uh, the, the convention is actually scheduled to be at Chuck Norris. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I want to clarify that. He doesn't do push-ups. He pushes the earth down. Yes. <laughs> and all memes associated with uh, associated with uh there's lots of wrestling guests there you know i'm a huge wrestling fan so i'm i'm giddy for that star trek the next generation uh jonathan frakes uh, commander rikers is going to be there um so i hope to get them get to meet all those people um you know of course great toys so uh if you're in the area please stop by the capture prey booth and uh be sure to check uh check us out uh, i know orson is going to have some of the unrustable bastards there uh the kickstarter exclusive otomo uh very limited numbers uh will be on sale at lexington comic-con so if you want to pick up a kickstarter exclusive otomo stop by the capture prey booth uh because that's the only place that's going to be available uh at conventions uh until they are sold out and i know orson got exactly one case so that's how limited they are uh, for him. Um, so check me out. Check us out at uh, Capture Prey at Lexington Comic Con. As always, TFYLP is on Twitter at TFYLP and on Facebook.com slash groups slash TFYLP. If you want to continue to talk with us on there. Um, tonight's episode... Uh, is going to, we're going to talk a little bit about something. Uh, you know, last episode we talked about lines that we had high hopes for, and uh, once they came out, we kind of uh, were largely disappointed, or our interest fell off, or they just didn't really succeed. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about a, a, a Transformers line that uh, was, I guess, scheduled to happen and then didn't. Uh, we're going to find out a little bit about that, um, you know, some history behind that. Uh, this, the line is, a lot of people may have heard of it. If you've been in the fandom for any length of time, you've heard the term trans tech. Um, it's, uh, it was scheduled to come after Beast Machines uh, in, the, in the slot, I guess, R.I.D. was supposed to come in, I guess. What uh, oh. R.I.D. filled in. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, and around 2001-ish, um, and uh, for some reasons that we'll probably talk about here tonight, uh, it just didn't come to be. Uh, lots of great designs were shown. Um, I know, I believe, Transtech Starscream was one of the first ones that, that we saw. And I remember seeing it on uh, TFW, and I was really, really excited uh, for this line. Uh, you know, growing up with Generation 1, I wasn't much on the Beasts at the time. Uh, I didn't have as much of an appreciation for them then as I did now, as I do now. Uh, 
and I was really eager to get back to more vehicular forms uh, for Transformers. And Transtex uh, was taking what was great about Beast Wars, some of the great toys, and bringing vehicles uh, to the uh, to the line or giving them vehicular form. Um, Don, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you know about Trans uh, Transtex? First. Well, coming off of Beast Machines, I was extremely disappointed. I, we know we've talked about before how Beast Machines is it's just not my thing. Um, but I was hearing rumors at BotCon, this Transtech stuff. We were getting bits and pieces uh, coming out. Uh, I was still on Alt Toys Transformers at the time, and there was wild speculation that this was going to be like a new G1 set on Cybertron, and they were rebooting everything to get away from the beasts. And, you know, just all the stuff you hear whenever you hear the slightest bit of information, everybody... Rumors start and, flying. <laughs> and just runs like the Flash with the slightest crumb of information. Um, and then we saw... I don't... I, again, after so many years in the fandom, everything starts to blend. Hmm. But I remember the Optimus Prime picture showing up with the truck mode, the half track kind of truck mode, kind of like what we eventually almost got a in. war within. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly the the Ford front, the the back, kind of like Cup, but a little more beefy. And those more... arms, though. Yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> oh my Mon God. Monkey truck, as it was called, Mon yeah, affectionately. Truck, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people said, "Oh, this is going to be a continuation of Base Machines." They're going to bring Primal back, and then you'll have Megatron come back, and this is them coming back to finish up and set all the all the wrongs that happened in Beast Machines. This is going to fix everything that happened wrong. <laughs> all in <Beast> the wrongs, <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, that's all the sins I, committed, you are forgiven. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that, that's one thing I kept seeing a lot of is people thought this was going to be <sighs> the fix for Beast Machines where it left off. Uh, other than that, it was just a lot of rumors, a lot of speculation. And then we heard, to my wallet's immense dismay, <coughs> that Robots in Disguise was coming over, <coughs> that I had already paid for importing the entire Wave 1, as I've mentioned Mr. Archer before. Thank you for that. So I wound up buying them all again. You. <laughs> yes. so you, got, you got some good items. Yeah, I, good I, items. I twice. I got, they were so good, I got them twice. But so at, I least I at least I changed the deco and stuff. For oh, you yeah. I mean, I'm, oh, I'm, they're they're pr pride and joy. I'm hoping for a masterpiece fire convoy at some point. Um, but that's all I really remember is a lot of rumors, a lot of speculation. It's going to it's going to fix these machines. It's going to be a G1 reboot. They're, they're scrapping everything and starting. Pretty much that's what I kept hearing is they didn't know what it was going to be, but it was going to be a, a, either a. A, a fix for Beast Machines, or they're going to scrap everything and start over, is is what the two things I heard the most of at the time. Hmm. Jim, what do you remember about Transtech? Transtech. Uh, a lot of what I remember were uh, some of the uh, some of the really really outlandish uh, uh, modes for for the different characters. Uh, one that sticks out in my mind was uh, was uh, Cheetor. Oh, yeah, kind of the the wheels integrated into his legs. I, I thought that was that was pretty pretty neat because it was it was so far outside of the uh, the convention that we were used to, which Beast Machines got into that a bit. Uh, you know, where it's not just like a, a a blocky robot. You know, it doesn't have to conform to any one you know set thing. You know, I mean, Be Beast Wars did that to to a point. You know, but even even look at you know optimal optimus or, or tiger hawk or something like that you still have a little bit of that blocky feel but uh that was all just kind of blown away with uh with beast machines and then later on with with the di designs we saw for trans tech yeah. um and i i think that the wheel thing that that kind of came back for uh, animated blur didn't it i think yeah. animated blur was actually uh given a trans tech cheetor homage in the uh, collector's club yeah uh, yeah yeah I, I, you know, Derek Wyatt is such a fan. It, I wouldn't put it past him. I can't confirm it, but I wouldn't put it past him to have homage that that Transtech mold in Blur. But it's also a good design, regardless. So he could have independently got there too. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Aaron, you know, we you've you've heard what we saw as yeah. the fans. Uh, you know. From back in the day, you know, this is what we saw, this is what we heard, this is how we felt. 
what was it really? What what was the purpose of TransTech? What was it, and uh, yeah, how did it come to be? Um, well, I was on uh, the periphery of the team that worked on that, and then certainly inherited files and folders and stacks of art uh, very soon after. Um, and some of my friends worked on it internally uh, at Hasbro on the art, uh, along with Draxel Jump and. Ken Lashley, who's a big name in comics, um, who helped design a lot of these characters. Uh, so I just want to be clear that I'm I'm giving a half step story myself because some of the players just aren't. Unfortunately, some of them aren't even with us anymore. Um, so I give I'll give you my best recollection recollection of being a guy next to the team. Okay, so that's you. You that's had a more of a front with. front row seat than yeah. we did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. So it definitely. Uh, that, a lot of that development was happening on the toy side back then. Um, a lot of that um, that mainframe would get would be the finished models. They did not involve themselves in the early development. That would have been uh, an added expense for the animation. So the Kenner design team, Fantasy Factory at the time is what it was called, um, you know, basically started creating characters. And a lot of them were based on what was happening on Beast Machines. They were kind of guiding, not, on, not unlike I guided the Unicron trilogy from a creative strategy standpoint, there was another group of characters who, or uh, em- employees, who guided the Beast Wars, Beast Machines into trans tech uh, things. Mm-hmm. Uh, they So they were working on these things as a, as the next sequel to Beast uh, Machines, right? Uh, everything started changing in 2000 at, at the Cincinnati office, and I'm sure in the Rhode Island office, unbeknownst to the employees in the Cincinnati office, that episode one was not as good as it needed to be, and you know the, the, the foundation by which everything is designed and planned started shifting, right? So everything this, starts with uh, starts and ends with Star Wars. <laughs> I don't want to say I don't totally want to say it that way, but you know, if Beast Machines had been doing better, this wouldn't have been as big a deal. But when everything was shaky, particularly the big thing in Star Wars at the time, it made uh, it made for some decisions down the down the road. So Beast Machines was ongoing. It was kind of strange. The, the team had a very uh, a slow roll approach to getting back to vehicles. Clearly, uh, they didn't want to get back to a true truck right away. Um, so they were still exploring weird forms and transitional forms between monkeys and trucks and cheetahs and speed and and those kinds of things. You can see that very plainly in those designs. Um, and and they were exploring those things and they were designing them up. You can find them online. I think. Largely, these these designs have been uh, made public of all the crazy jet planes and cars and trucks and you know that they were looking at, and a lot of that stuff is the Draxel Jump Ken Lashley stuff that's out there. Um, and during that development, there's also some storyline things that are happening, kind of just uh, directional pitches. So internally, we, we that team could go in and say yeah, we're going to go this direction. And it was all about finding the transformative power last year. Now this year, it's going to be about capturing that power and turning into something bigger and better. And and that was kind of the, you know, two-sentence brief that I'm sure the animation team would have gone off on and, and figured out more deeply. I am not sure any uh, animation development went too... F- I don't think anything went too far. There may be a treatment... Well, it's like or something out there. It, um, did you, didn't you say that they they were waiting for like the finished designs and it really never got that yeah, far? Or? Yeah, yeah. It they would have, uh, you know, th- they worked right up until the last minute on each episode because of the at the time that that CG show was pretty impressive um, technologically. So they were pushing it to its boundaries even then. So every Beast Machines episode was delivered and all that stuff well even really even up until so, uh transformers prime wasn't wasn't it like some episodes were like finished like the week before it aired or something yeah I that believe. can happen i mean it depends on 
how fast you need that thing out. And yeah. yeah. So, uh, they would have been finishing up these machines as, as a development group and would not probably have had time to get out of that pipeline to look at anything else. So that was, I'm thinking largely all done in the Cincinnati office, uh, with that fantasy factory group, um, as they prepped for, uh, you know, what could be a group of characters and shows. Now, concurrent to that, how toy development works, you still got to hit the dates. So at some point, somebody uh, must have said, well, let's go with these best designs with Takara, or let's see if Takara can execute these. We did work with Takara in, as a, can we test this out? Can you make a model that goes from A to B, and it's a compelling experience? Um, we've talked a lot about that with uh, Transformers Animated. You know, could they get that that look? Mm-hmm. Um, so I have seen enough models on TransTech to wonder if it was a full first wave more so than a uh, just a group of test models. I can't confirm that, but there were too many models at too many price points uh, that were finished for me to think that it was just testing things out. And those models were quite complete um, as far as their fit and finish. Uh, gray, like a gray a, proto? A white, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's what I consider uh, a, a tooling model is what we called it. Um, we would take that apart, you know, make our mold plans and then our deco plans and so on and so forth. Uh, so um, there's too many of those models and they're too well finished. The Starscream model has a working light in it. Um, I'm not sure if that's ever been aware, you know, made aware in any of the documentation, but I know that one worked. Uh, I know I played with the Cheetor one. Um, the one that I often bring up that I saw, uh, we, we obviously came out with the Megabolt Megatron at the deluxe scale. Mm-hmm. So some of these models did actually come out oh, so <clears throat> in the RI, in Me- the RID era. Um, yeah. So Megabolt, Megabolt. Was, was a trans tech. Yeah, that oh, was wow, totally okay. a TransTech design nice. that, that, that got worry, to a certain man. degree. Now, I saw a model that was at least two times the size of that oh. Megatron. Oh, wow. That that had a feature in it that you rolled it, and it kind of had some uh, pincher-type things that that ate small, like I would call them Minicon, Optimus, and Cheetor, oh, wow. and... You know, they they were they were that kind of that scale, and that was the feature. Like it was this big. It was going to become, I think, like a Unicron head. You know, like a giant floating Megatron so head or something. Would it have would it have been in effect kind of a, the equivalent to like the uh, the the ship mode? Yeah, probably that, that we saw in the Beast Machines series. Or Prob- something, maybe something prob- akin to it. Yeah, but that's that's what they were working on. Um. Uh, I know here's, here's another factor to take into account, you know, so I'm trying to put everybody in a a time and place because it's not just all these toys got made and they didn't come out. Right. Um, there is a whole story. (laughs) Yeah. You also had the fact that Takara had a very difficult time, uh, airing any of these episodes for the Japan market. Everybody knows they need 52 episodes. They air them once. They don't rerun anything. They put them out on DVD two months later. That's just their model. And and so when Hasbro were doing these 13-episode Beast War, 13-episode Beast War, 13-episode, you know, it, it was kind of uh, difficult for Takara to air in the Japan market. So that's why they had to make Beast, Beast Wars Neo really? and things like that to kind of get to 52 episodes. So Beast Machines made no sense for the Japanese market. Uh, they, they thought that those forms were pretty whack, right? <laughs> they were... They were not. They were not something a collector would want, like a, a fine-tuned car. You know, mm-hmm. like they were obviously thinking about for RID, and and they were not f- fantastical enough either in some ways. Uh, so for the Japanese market, I think they looked at that whole series as kind of weird, and so the idea that they would then pick up TransTech, it was like they were like, uh, we're just basically making toys for the world market. We're not going to air any of this. So it really wasn't good for the partnership at that time either. Put a strain so on the relationship. Uh, they just couldn't benefit from it. So yeah. it was kind of it was just kind of a one-way street, which, you know, it, 
as you see, we turned the corner with Armada, you know, that benefit opened up immensely, uh, mm-hmm. how we work together. So, you know, you had, you wanted to work better with Takara and Hasbro. You wanted that to go better. You had the market shifting with the toy market with Star Wars, and they were changing where Hasbro was going to be located. You know, our office was located in Cincinnati. They were moving us to Rhode Island. Um, you had a show that really wasn't working on the market that it was in anyway. And you had a charismatic new leader coming in, Brian Goldner, who was like, yeah, this, uh, this stuff's all great and interesting, but let's just get back to basics. You know, let's just get back to vehicles. How do we do that? And everyone that was like dying for that were like, yes, please. And some of the people that were like slow rolling it were like, well, we got this theory and da, da, da. and you know, they got reassigned. I ended up inheriting Transformers <laughs> and uh, the, the rest is a little bit history. But the decision was made, uh, I think, in late 2000, probably November, October, November, September of 2000, that we were not going to go forward with trans tech that we were going to seriously look at importing RID or car robots at the time. It didn't even have the name RID, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it was just this, mm-hmm. we just got, I've, I've told you guys this uh, one other time, one day we just got giant boxes. Um, so I'll, I'll transition here. So at the end of 2000, uh, the guy, that's when they told us, hey, we're, we're moving to Rhode Island, right? And some of those guys that were on Transformers were the ones that are uh, I'm not going to make that move. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, and yeah. they moved on and and I raised my hand and said, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. So then I started working on all this stuff. So I inherited like this kind of weird mess. Like, well, we have these models. We're finishing up this weird show that you don't have to do anything with because it's already going. We got, we got all these new toys from Japan coming in. So they sent these giant boxes of every car robot item they were making. Um, and the Gal Gar stuff and mm. the, the all that stuff, right? We talked about. So it was oh. everything they were making of that era to like reengage. Ha- the Hasbro design team was shifting. It was shifting from the guys that had been doing it that looked at it a particular way to to Car having an opportunity to kind of go, hey, we also like this stuff. Kind of like let's get back together versus you you know, making a show that we just make the toys for you from. Um, and that's how Armada, you know, looks the way it looks. Kind of, we got back to that more of that classic stuff, right? The, the articulation. Blocky, yeah. yeah. Articulation was really big to the previous designer. You know, that, that was everything to that guy. Um, not as much to me, obviously. Um, so you could see that the individual designers also can, can influence some of those decisions. Uh, So I'm getting away a little bit from trans tech. So basically in that transition, uh, trans tech really quickly just died like that. It was like, this car doesn't want it. Beast Wars isn't working. We're going to go a different direction. We're going to go full vehicle. Let's develop something completely new. Aaron, go figure that out. Um, and, And just like that, all that work had just been stopped. So basically, what, the move the it move from stopped. Cincinnati to Rhode Island is a, is a large part of it, uh, because it's a lot a, of the it's people an aspect just, of it, yeah, yeah. The, the people and, and that new that new leader came in and wanted to get right to vehicles. So all these weird vehicles, they were dead on arrival then too, and yeah. that's why we you know got got to Armada. Well, uh, two two things, Mr. Archer. Uh, one. I would have absolutely loved to have seen what you could have done with Cal Gygar. Hmm. I would have absolutely <laughs> loved to have seen a, 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 a product from Hasbro, the Cal Gygar set and maybe Optimus Prime colors, the story behind I would have I would have paid cash that money. Stuff was, yeah, that stuff's fun. I, yeah. I like that stuff. I still, yeah. Gal Gygar uh, himself is fun. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But it seems to me that with this new, with it, with them announcing at Toy Fair, the War for Cybertron, with what we know, it sounds like it's a pre, more than meets the eye, pre G one, ev- uh, time period on Cybertron before they leave for Earth, is what we're kind of thinking as a fandom right now. Do you think maybe some of these trans tech designs could still be used? 
for pre-Earth modes? Because it seems like you yeah, don't. I mean, they, I mean, if the if, if the actual design still exists in a Bible or a binder or a book, you would you would not want to throw that away. You'd put it on a shelf and say, "We keep all the stuff that we think of because at some point down the road, we might yeah. be able to use this or that." So it seems yeah. like to me that if that still exists as a thing that they can reference, it might could come back in this War for Cybertron line. Because you've got pre-Earth vehicle modes pretty much built in right there. Yeah, I think that usually comes down to the individual designers, how they mentally approach their job, whether they can find value in old work, invent it, or just have the attitude of new is better. Um, I know Takara keeps everything. And if I if I had you know, if I had some purpose to email Takara and go, Hey, can you give me all the sketches I did for X products, you know, they would have them. Yeah, uh, wow. I, I you know, that's no disrespect to Hasbro when I say that you couldn't do that with Hasbro. Um, you know, you just don't they don't keep the files the same way. But um it, it just so all like- those all those designs exist. On. Yeah. I just it's well, all the matter of who, it's, who it's wants like, to look at it and pull them out, you know, and right. why. It's like Rick told us, you know, the, uh, a lot of the original uh, Generation One uh, box art. Yeah. a lot of that got thrown out, you know. Uh, just it, it just yeah, it just seems like that with the, with the line being that close to being fully conceived and ready to start the next stage, it would save them a lot of hassle. For War for Cybertron, if this stuff was already that far planned out, I, that's just what yeah. I think. Yeah. So um, we know that um, I guess a large part of the Trans Tech designs got to the what a lot of fans refer to as the Gray Proto stage. Uh, what? Yep. How? How much farther uh, beyond that is it till we get to finished product ready to go to uh, store shelves? Just to get an so, idea of how close it was to actual release. Yeah, so those gray those gray models, um, whether you call them tooling models or prototype models or you know whatever, there's any number of terms. Uh, though those are what would go to a factory to get cast um, to be made into molds. Uh, so most of them never got made to a point where you could make them in plastic, right? Mm-hmm. Those are all hand handmade mold or handmade toys, essentially those gray prototypes. Um, so other than, uh, other than maybe that Megatron, I don't think any of them ever made it to a tooling stage where they could be, you know, they're not hiding somewhere and just waiting to have hot plastic put into them. Um, so the Meg- Megatron did make the the tooling. Oh, well, the I, Megabolt, I think yeah, that's, that's right. yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's the only one. Now, did did the only other one is Cerberus, Bru- which the came dog. as R.I.D. Bruticus. Bruticus, yeah. yeah, yeah. Where I I I'm confused in my memory about where that one came from. That could be a Trans Tech also. I thought it was it's like a a, uh, a discarded uh, Beast Machines idea. It might have. It might have been, but that's the only other oddball one that I knew existed before I came onto the line, and it didn't. It was like a lot. So what happens is, I'll give you a little insight. Every every toy that goes to a certain level of development, uh, once it becomes tooled, Hasbro is almost committed to making it. Otherwise, the part of the deal that Hasbro and Takara work out, uh, Hasbro eats the whole bill, right? So ideally. Ideally, anything that gets made to a tool will come out eventually, right, in some capacity. Um, or just costs a lot on the budget, which is fine, too. But um, so I remember that, that that three-headed dog was one of those items that I had. I inherited a finished item that I didn't know what the hell it was because mm-hmm. I don't think it was in the show. And I I, I didn't. Like I, I decoed that thing. I had no idea what I was decoing, you know, and why. <laughs> um, I made up that goofy story that he guarded, you know, Megatron's prison, and uh, you know that was about it. But that's one of the characters that I remember sticking out as far as 
being a confused item around that time. I didn't know if that was a Beast Machines or Trans Tech or what. I think that's the only release we got of it too, wasn't it? Or was it ever recolored? Yeah, I, I, don't I don't believe that it was. I don't think so. That wasn't deemed a very good item. No, I, I remember I I got it. And oh, uh, Battle Battle Unicorn. That one. That one was a a late late Beast Machines mm-hmm. that got put into RID as well. Yeah, uh, I remember BBTS had a, so there's a special run of them made because they were so hard to find at retail. Yeah, yeah. So that's like there are more there are more loose ends on the Beast Machine side than there were ever front ends on the trans tech side like it really it was really a development part of the plan and then, and when that development needed to change it every it just that was it yeah, so it really is a it's a loss it's more of a lost concept than a lost toy line mm-hmm. you you brought up uh, a few minutes ago uh you know uh, hasbro footing the bill and, and the, the cost involved in, in getting you know so far into the process yeah. And it, it reminded me of uh, something we, we talked about uh, just a little bit ago. We we had, uh, you know, briefly discussed the the crowdfunding that uh, they're doing with this, the job of the hut thing for Star Wars. Yep. And I, I almost wonder if uh, if Transformers were to uh, attempt that, like like we we considered like the possibility of a of a Unicron, for instance. Uh, I wonder how realistic of a possibility such a thing would be among the fans if they were to somehow go back to some of the trans tech designs and just pick some of the, the best ones or the ones that yeah. were furthest along and have those as a, as an offering to reach uh, at, at goal X. I don't and, know where they, yeah, I don't know where they are with it now. I'm going to take a half step back and I can get back to the, how they're doing the HasLab thing. Hmm. Um, but like they were really into the fan choice and fan voting, right. uh, making the new characters and some, you know, all of that. Um, you know, I wonder if there's a way to have the greatest almost hits option. You know, across a spectrum of lines, there's all there's been a few few characters that haven't gotten made, correct? You know, oh. or or mm-hmm. you know that that would almost be cool for. For ha- that'd be an interesting way for Hasbro to approach it as well. Sure. Um, you know, could they? Could they? You know, there's these lost gems out there. Which ones should we retool? Mm-hmm. Um, and and then and then fund it that way as well, because then you could really see where, you know, East, watch out, East Neo Unicron, <laughs> here it comes. <laughs> you know that thing actually looked really really good. Uh, it did. I, that- I had that thing in my office for about two months. Wow. And- you know, it was really cool, and it was it was early, early days, 2001. Um, I don't think I had been to a BotCon yet. Uh, and uh, everybody that came into my office was just like, oh, like, that's really cool. Like, uh, so it was really cool. That, <laughs> that re- never really reached... I really hated uh, to send that one back to Tokyo. <laughs> that one never really reached t- uh, tooling, did it? It just got to the great program. No. No, so so that's what happens. You you kind of you build these models and then you cost them and then you realize, oh well, we're gonna have to do this, that, or the other, or it's too heavy, or you know whatever it is. Um, and that one was always a little too expensive for just the Japanese market, which it fit their show. Um, so there was a lot of enthusiasm on the Japan side to do Unicron, um, which showed in that model and that kind of helped influence us as we for Armada Unicron. Made, made our choices around Armada Unicron, and then so Takara was kind of happy they could and have a Unicron. This guy we were comes. happy because that's a big <laughs> item. Uh, yeah, and uh, so that that's kind of how that all. So you know, when you make and that's how it works, really behind the scenes. You know, you're always inspired by all kinds of things. That I mean, toys is you know probably eighty percent stuff that you pitch that doesn't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so so. You know that seeing some of those old models always inspired other things, and you know, so trans tech lives. You yeah. you know, you just can't tell how. Hmm. Well, well, Mr. Roger, I've got a, I got a, well, it's a, st- a slight story and a question for you. Uh, when I was in my early teens, I sent in a design to Hasbro. I, I, I created I created an aerial bot or, or robot anyway. Uh, they were based, making transformers in your teens, Tom. Yeah, yes, they were. You know, oh. it, was out of, it was out of stones and wood, but yes. 
Um, no, mostly Adobe Mud Brick. <laughs> you those Japanese Transformers early. But um, I, I did send in the design, and I got back the letter in the Hasbro because they were still using the little the two kids back to back. They were still kids, using yep. the, that logo. I'm not sure what the official name is. That's just the way I remember it. And it was in yep. blue, and it was addressed to me. They thanked me for my time. Uh, that they could not accept my submission at the time. It's uh, called a they, form letter, Don. Yeah, I know, but I'm, <laughs> I'm saying though they actually got it, and they and they and they replied. I was happy about that. I was sorry that they didn't use my design for the robot that I called Air Raid seven months before the aerial bots came out. But, but, uh, what, but with you being a former designer and you having all this skill, could you not freelance for Hasbro to get some of these designs that you like Trans Tech to possibly back in the mix? Since your designs uh, would carry weight with them, no, I, I don't think it quite works like that. Okay, um, honestly, I, I wasn't sure. I just thought maybe it, they if have, you, uh, you know, that would be they, something you could do. No, no, probably not. Okay, I don't think, okay. Man, I, I had my time in the sun. I don't think anybody know, wants to hear just, from me, Doc. Well, let's well, say I want two foot, <laughs> I want that two foot tall jumbo machinder optimus with the with the purposely loose. Missile well, I firing want that too. I do want yeah, that I too. Want that. Don, they, they would just send him the same form letter. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. But I, I, I just didn't know if that was for certain to your retirement package. Please yeah. don't call us. I just thought maybe it would be a way to get some of these, some of the stuff that you remember that you liked, maybe back into the mix. You know, with your name well, recognition. I mean, and everything. let's 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 cut to the chase, fellas. I mean, you know, it wasn't my choice not to do trans tech, but as a new designer on the stuff. It wasn't my interest to look at that stuff either. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so some of that, you know, designer arrogance, you know, everybody has it. You want to leave yeah. your stamp. You want to kind of put your mark oh, on it. God, somebody um, else's, yeah. You, yeah, you, you, and, and you stamp with a giant stamp. So, I mean, I mean, you are you are the probably the most famous person coming out of Hasbro <laughs> other than Optimus Prime himself. No, nah, I don't know about that. But, um, well, you did. I mean, with every, a character everyone animated. Is, yes. The uh, I don't even know what I'm saying now. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Don. Don you, you're making him blush now. Stop. <laughs> all right, no, no, I'm sorry. It's just I'm just the, saying uh, you're you're a big wig in the toy industry, and it just seems like all your ideas not being able to be used is kind of a waste. Well, they 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 everything has a cycle. I mean, everything's trend based. Uh, so, you know, clearly, uh, they've been focusing on, you know, Bumblebee and the characters there and the movies and stuff. So that's what they're focused on. You know, honestly, some item from 2000 or 99 or whenever that stuff was designed, uh, you know, just isn't on the radar until it needs to be places like the bot cons and things like that were great places, uh, to try to put those things out and almost yep. now it feels like there's fewer and fewer of those opportunities uh, and or focus on Hasbro's side to, to utilize some of those opportunities. Yeah. So, um, you know, trying to put my best, best hat on there with it, but uh, you know, sometimes stuff just dies on the side of the road. I've said that to you guys before, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, not every great idea deserves to be brought to the, to the full, you know, to the shelf. Um, I'll also say that uh, those trans tech models would have would have uh, yeah. they changed Price. the cost. They changed the cost dynamic of the of the pro. Yeah, they were they were going to be on that upper end, and uh, not that car robots the the brothers were any less intricate. Um, but. Uh, that was that was another factor. They were pretty intricate models, and we wanted to get to more feature based. Clearly, mm -hmm. with what you got out of Armada, right. uh, a little bit more toy, a little more fun, a little more intuitive, a little, little less slick, high end design. You know, no feature, fancy story. Uh, you know, you can see that they were just trying to get back to basics, and yeah. Trans Tech represented something that was just in the middle. Plus, you wind up having the collectible gimmick. For the Japanese market specifically, with because we, we're still we up until the last couple of years we're, we were still getting 
special yeah. uh, mini cons and and various yeah. packs and stuff. So so the collectability of a mini con has far exceeded the original run of the series. Yeah, I mean when I uh, humbly put my list of accomplishments together on the brand, you know the introduction of mini cons and naming them mini cons, which you know I'll I'll, I'll respect the micro masters. You know, but that aspect of it, I, you know, that's, that's a big thing to leave behind. And that's kind of cool that they, that they lingered and they, they're kind of now a part of the lore all the time. Um, not just that one Armada series. Uh, so that, that is kind of cool um, when, when that stuff can happen. A uh, couple questions here. Uh, well, one of them you may not be able to answer, but uh, what do you know about the uh, new character that was rumored in TransTech, Immorticon? Anything? I don't remember that name. Is there a was there a form uh, well, associated in I the uh, art in the TransTech wiki and on TF Wiki? Uh, one new character uh, was rumored, uh, and its uh, name was Immorticon. Um, oh, let's see here. Uh, I, th I thought you well, said Morticon, not Immorticon. No, Immorticon. Uh, okay. It was a uh, technomorph named Immorticon. Uh, according to the wiki, it says, uh, what is known is that he was a member of the elite class of the city Axiom Nexus a peaceful on a peaceful Cybertron where no Transformer Civil War had ever broke out. Um, hmm. And uh, let's see here, a picture they have of him, I guess, looks uh, sort of like um, Armada Demolisher in, in vehicle form. Uh, robot form, not so much, maybe. Uh, yeah. I, I've just got it on my phone. I'm going to hold it up here. I don't know if anybody can see it, but... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember that design. Um, we like that design. I think Shockwave became that design years later. That's, uh, but I don't remember the characters. That I wasn't part of any of the copy i didn't see anything written down mm -hmm. or you know paragraphs on what this character or that character were meant to be so i i just i can't confirm that although uh after this i'm gonna i'm gonna try to dig out some stuff with another person to see if if there can be some loose threads thrown okay. back into here yeah, clear um, about the, uh, on the on the story sides yeah mm-hmm uh, I mean, that was one here. It was kind of thrown in there as a new character, and there wasn't a whole lot, you know, outside of that picture and what I read there on the wiki. Um, yeah. The other question I had, uh, you mentioned him earlier before, Draxel Jump. Uh, tell us about yep. him, since these are largely, looks like largely his designs. Yeah, so Draxel Jump was a studio that was founded by the artist Ken, Ken Lashley. Um, who is like a huge name in, in comic books. He does all kinds of covers and stuff. Um, and he is a friend of Hasbro and has been. Oh, your video froze. And uh, oh, so he, he uh, me, me or you? Uh, uh, you froze. Uh, I, I, maybe it might have been me. I don't know. <laughs> well, on my end, the entire thing froze. Everybody just it's thought it was probably just messy. Skype. Yeah. All right, so Ken Ken is a guy from Canada who does does comic books and stuff these days, and was big friend to Hasbro. Still is does all kinds of work for their, uh, you know, does some of the Comic Con box art and stuff, and uh, real fun guy. Um, and uh, he he did a lot of those designs. Um, his studio and him did those designs. So, uh, and that's that's kind of how they did it back then. They would have outside guys. Uh, draw up just a ton of stuff and then kind of you know put stuff up on a wall and circle the ones that people like more let's change this color that color very very efficient um creation uh so that's 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 what he's about so he's uh he's a he's a great guy and a heck of a talent and he helped me on uh the early armada pitches as well he, he helped me make some uh really cool boards that helped sell that in so let's focus in on, uh, okay, TransTech has essentially died. Uh, and yeah. uh, RID has been, uh, the choice has been made to transition with RID into Armada. Uh, 
walk us through whenever the decision was brought down. Okay, TransTech is dead. We're going to go with yep. RID. Uh, what happened then? So uh, the toy industry is a fast-moving industry. You you literally drop what you were doing and pivot to the next request. Um, probably there's already a, a, a schedule crisis involved, right? Um, so what would happen is those models would get packed up in their boxes and the loose uh, photocopies and color copies and boards would all get put into envelopes and manila folders and things and just kind of shoved off to the filed. side. Uh, yeah, filed. Um, so I inherited some of those manila folders and uh, flat file kind of work um, to look through all that Draxel jump work. Um, and then over the years, I also, you know, as just how it all worked, uh, I inherited a lot of those gray models and I returned them to uh, Kenner or <laughs> Kenner, uh, Takara. So I, I personally took the Starscream model back to Takara and said, here, you guys, you, you archive these things better than we do. You should have the, the model, not us. So, so the Transtech uh, models. I, I physically, probably, I physically gave them back the Transtech model. Yeah. So the Transtech models probably still do exist so, over in Japan so somewhere. That, that's what happened at Hasbro's side, yeah. right? So we moved on. I, I, I had to. I mean, I was doing two lines, right? I had to then transition the RID product. So adjust. I had to. We had, we had to pick names. We had to adjust colors, adjust sound chips, uh, come up with our packaging look. Uh, obviously the Autobot and Decepticon logo hadn't been used for a number of years, so we had to define that for Hasbro packaging. Uh, so there was a lot of work there to do, as well as then what's Minicons and what that's going to be and who's our animation partner going to be and all this stuff was all going on. So y you can imagine that Transtech stuff got dropped <laughs> really quick mm. when that, you know... I, I remember the, whenever, dual from, lining from the fans' perspective, you know, it's like... You know, we were we were we knew of Transtech. We'd seen some of the, uh, uh, yeah. like I said, the Starscream, I think, uh, design, and I believe the Primal was uh, was also shown. Uh, and we were yeah. basically bracing for the uh, the 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 coming of this line. And then it's just like, okay, we're getting our ID, yeah. and we're like, oh, well, what happened to Transtech? And it's just like nobody talked about it anymore. You know? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I remember at the time we didn't we didn't talk about it. I think not that there was any bad blood with mainframe or anything, but it was, you know, it was just a sudden transition. New people again, we transitioned from the Cincinnati office to the Rhode Island office. So anybody anyone worked with on Transformers before 2000, uh December of 2000, you never saw again after 2000. Takara never saw him again. Animation partners never saw them again. Internal Hasbro, other licensing groups and things. So it was like I was the first person uh, in my boss on the new, what became the new Transformer group. So that's a, it's a very fine schism right there mm -hmm. when that change, change happened, which also contributed to all new people. You know, what's this trans tech? I mean, I had people telling me, Oh, Beast Wars, that was terrible. We can do way better than that, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you weren't even there. You don't, like, it was a huge part of what we, that team contributed yeah. to the company. It, it, was it a, revitalized it was the brand. <laughs> that was a good, that was a good number for a couple of years as far as sales go. But, you know, it's, again, there's a very not invented here, you know, mentality. I didn't touch it, so it must have stunk, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been on the merry-go-round. I was on the merry going around a long time, so I, I got to see a few of these twists and turns going all the way back to Beast Machine or Beast Wars. Uh, so yeah, that 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 transition just also contributed to. So was nothing, nothing being ever said again and ever showing up again because it was it was dropped in Cincinnati and never really picked up again. Now the the. Decision to kill Transtech and go a different direction, uh, which eventually would become Armada uh, and the Unicron Trilogy. Uh, you said uh, the there there needed to be some space made there, which RID essentially filled. Um, yeah. So I guess 
in the in the transition from Transtech to RID was basically very very short. The the molds were already done. Like you said, you just needed to come up with yeah, packaging. Yeah, so I could and, I, I could talk about that. So yeah. what what happened right before I got put on Transformers, which was in that November, early November timing of two thousand. Uh, my boss and the new what would become you know Brian Goldner, but the CEO and stuff. Uh, his first job, he came in and him and Brian went to Japan and they talked to Takara and Takara said, well, we have this show. We have a lot of ideas. We'd love to partner with you. You know, the stuff you're doing doesn't work for us. And Brian Goldner was like, absolutely. Let's get back to basics. Bam, bam, bam. So it was, it was all in conjunction. Like trans tech became wrong to answer any of the new questions. Mm Mm-hmm. Again, not wrong for why it was designed and when it was designed and how it was designed, but wrong to the, be the answer we needed with cool new vehicles, you know, classic characters, get back to basics, put it on Earth, you know, very foundational things that you, we wanted to see or, or, you know, we were trying to get at. Um, so that became, that became the focus. And huh? RID was a great opportunity to kind of go, well, it has everything. It's on Earth. It has vehicles people know. You know, it's it's got a fun story. It can give us time to develop this other thing. Um, easy peasy. Hasbro doesn't have to invest anything in a whole new series to get us get us to that point. Um, so it was like a it was a perfect situation for everybody. Had their Takara had spent money on those tools, and they were happy to get some extra uh, revenue from that those that tooling. So. Uh, again, all good reasons for Transtech to just never be thought of again. You know, it, it, come to think on. of it, yeah. it's kind of unprecedented, isn't it? Uh, before and even since, to have a line, you know, essentially announced uh, because Transtech was announced, uh, and, you know, this is going to be the successor to Beast yeah. Machines. Uh, you know, yeah. so far as the gray protos were made, and then it just yep. it died. It had never well, happened in Transformers before the, and hasn't happened since. No, I think it shows the power of a, a new leader, a, a leader that understood what the power of Transformers meant to Hasbro to come in and go, let's get back to basics. I, I, I think that's the only reason stuff like that would happen uh, because he, he, he had that power to yeah. go. Let's and, just, we got to get there faster, guys. Let's and here not, we are and, some 18 years later, and it's almost kind of, you know, the guy was a genius because look how strong the brand is now, you know. Well, that's, that's, that was the attitude we worked on. Like, not, not the, again, not that Beast Wars was wrong. Beast Machines was neither here nor there. Yeah. And Trans Tech was only going to be Continuation here nor there. of that. Again. So it was really, again, it's not. Nothing, everything is good. You put effort into everything. Mm-hmm. It, it, does it answer the right question for the right time? And, and that Armada and RID answer it like get kids into it again, get kids into it for just like in airplanes, you know, not some sci fi crazy blue jet with a bird beak, you know. Um, kind of like the Dinobots, you know, kids love dinosaurs, kids love robots. Yeah. Let's put them together. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so there was, it was, you know, it was pretty straightforward kind of request, but it, it opened us up to be able to get back to basics, get back to classic names, classic forms, classic colors, kind of the classic storylines, re-engage the fans who that stuff meant something to. Uh, I don't think I was ever going to convince anybody that, you know, Bat Boy was going to be the next big thing, you know. Um, uh, so. So. Um, now the, we we spoke about the, how the transition from trans tech to RID happened rather quickly. How soon after? Okay, we've got the RID ball rolling. It's you know we got the packaging and everything set. Uh, how quickly? You know how how long did you have to work on Armada before we first saw Armada uh, come out? Um. Well, we 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 dual pathed it. I was working on both of those lines at the same time. But again, the RID part of that was just uh, ad- adaptions, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't have... The tooling was safe. The tooling, you know... The, it's it, already done. All yeah. the, 
Yeah, yeah, all that stuff. So it was really adjusting colors, helping out with the copy and the names. Um, there, there wasn't a, a packaging, full packaging team that went to Rhode Island yet. That still was all beginning to be up and running. So my involvement in the in in that side of things was still large um, in those early days. Uh, that answer, did that answer your question? Well, I mean, the transition, you know, from RID into Armada, you know, uh, we're, we're kind so of we're, yeah, we're, coming we're, off the, we're off the hump of TransTech going through RID and then and going back up with Armada. But I can, what I can tell you is in, so Armada didn't drop on store shelves or the cartoon came out, what, August 03? I believe so. So the toys came out around that. I can tell you I was in Japan in summer of 2001 designing hotshot armada optimus for armada so two years and during that whole transition from january of 2001 to about that summer was the rid development um so about so we six were probably, months yeah six months for rid during that we were probably uh putting together binders of like these are the kinds of sports cars we want to do or these are the kinds of features we should look at or let's bring back these characters it was it's like a research project mm -hmm. more so than toy design um we were doing a lot of that for armada but we were and they were in uh takara uh were, was showing us um feature models at that time with with you plug in something and something happens and we go oh that's cool that'll work for a pickup truck put that in a pickup truck you know, or that feature's cool. Let's put that in a tank. Um, it, that kind of that kind of development uh, mm -hmm. up until I was doing styling development um, in the summer of 2001. So they already had figured out the models and the movement, and then I was doing that veneering. So the 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 first first uh, I would call first eight months of 2001 was uh, my most hectic crazy. <laughs> craziest hectic uh uh year i i didn't go home for thanksgiving in 2001 because i had the whole first wave of armada deco due the monday that we got back and i had only got the mold plans like the week before and at that time we still manipulated the mold plans to make it to be able to make a, a you know carry a color further you know hey, i mm -hmm. need this to also be that color so let's move this from mold a to mold b and that'll be a black and you know and so we there was a lot of mental manipulation going on right uh so that that first that first year was <laughs> all out all out that, all that out. sounds like, sound like if you had a sound like if you had a rubik's cube in like 40 parts <laughs> And you were trying to get all forty parts to match up together, but you couldn't yep. get them in the same yeah. place. Now, 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 I can add to that: some of those parts can be painted, some of them can't. Things like that. Yeah. You know, some of them can be molded in a, a metallic, some of them can't. Some can be clear, some can't. You have to do all that. It's like, and, it's you know, like that's, hey, that's the that's the job. You know, I'm not. Here's our Aaron Archer and his and his best friend ibuprofen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, well, I had I had uh, I had co-op extraordinary Eric Siebenhaler that at that time and and Joe Kide, and between uh, them and another guy named Chris, we managed to uh, we managed to get it all done. Well, <laughs> we, I we've remember, had Eric, Eric on the show before. He, he's yeah. awesome. Because I remember the BotCon where y'all showed the first episode of Armada. And, mm -hmm. and and we and we got the gift bags and in the gift bags were the f some of the first wave randomly put of the Armada figures it was hot shot cyclonus and demolisher yeah. i think yep. and that's the first wave and i remember but it, it, i guess it's a testament to your your speed and you getting them done because i remember finding them in the stores about 3 weeks before botcon so y'all must have really hit a stride at that point to get them out because because we were told at at the at botcon that was supposed to be the first big reveal and even y'all were surprised they were in stores at yeah. retail before, at that point um, yeah so you know so y'all must have really once you got past that eight months of of craziness 
something must have really clicked because they were in stores oh, we, before y'all even y'all even knew about it. Yeah, we uh, it, it was an interesting time to have the two companies working together. You know, so hand in glove to develop a show and a product line and earnestly trying to do it for the betterment of each other. Um, you know, was was really was really fun, and we got a lot of work done out of that respect um, yeah. and trust. So yeah, we we did we jammed on it for a good number of years. I will tell you that I have you know you'll never hear me talk bad about Takara, ever. Those guys work hard and they know their stuff and they're cool dudes. <laughs> well, it opened up a uh, you know the you said Trans Tech you know was largely done in house in Cincinnati, I guess, and then uh, with well, like the concepting, the concepting yeah. was done in house, you know. But w- yeah. beginning with Armada, you had a lot more interaction with. Takara, uh, yeah. I, I guess, in, in uh, from the well, basis it was of a design. Different type of commi- it was a different type of commitment. So for Beast Wars, uh, they had they always in the deal. I'll be loose about it. They always have rights in Japan. You know, whatever they work on, they can sell in Japan. Uh, but that doesn't always mean it's right for the Japanese market. You know, they they might be able to. They back then they would squeeze it in as an exclusive for the mom and pop shops, but it really wasn't a line they pushed or carried. Uh, largely um so the idea that we could co-develop these things and offer items and and features that would matter in their in their market in a significant way was was important too um because that hadn't happened for a while either and transformers uh you know we don't often talk about it because it's a global phenomenon but in japan transformers is not the highest profile robot brand you know, I mean, I think we have to, <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately we have to accept that there are, you know, uh, you know, probably, probably half dozen or more robot brands in Japan that are way more impactful on a daily basis than Transformers. So Takara's has always had, you know, I wouldn't call it a chip on their shoulder, but they have to be responsible in a different way because it's not like it's just going to show up on the shelf and fly like mm-hmm. you can and like we could at certain points. Uh, you can never guarantee sales. You never want to be that arrogant. But, you know, they knew that they wouldn't be able to sell some of this stuff. So co-development was big for them. And and they jumped in it, and they got great work done, and we had a great development process. And, you know, that's how that all well, went. Well, let me ask you this, sir. Uh, with the recent announcement that Hasbro and Takara will be sharing a lot of the same U.S. decos that we're not going to be getting near as many Takara upgrade yeah. repaints and stuff, do you think this could lead to that same kind of synergy, or is it just more of a cost-cutting measure? You know, I I don't know. I don't know. I've I, it's hard for me to know because I've always wondered. Each market needs different things out of their deco. Was the attitude right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Hasbro often we often go with more muted colors and slightly more sophisticated less raw out of the tube kind of colors whereas takara you know an orange is an orange you know black is black um uh, they also you know so i thought that they needed to brighten them up for their market so i don't know if they've come into an agreement with with warden that let's just do the decos for one global market and maybe we all will see something slightly different you know a little bit more brightness maybe but of, i don't know i don't of know of course it's, it, a, it's a nice it could nice, be one uh, of those effort it could be one of those instances where, okay, let's. Uh, this is what we're going to do. They do it, and then they're like, okay, this is not working for either of us. We'll just go back yeah. to what we were doing before. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but but as you know, Transformers as it ebbs and flows in Japan, you know, they they either do or don't have to put effort uh, the same amount of effort against it. So it might be, you know, I wouldn't call it cost cutting, but streamlining certainly. Let's just do one deco for the world. Uh, makes sense to me. Absolutely. Well, you know, I think we've, uh, you know, shed some light on trans tech, what it is, you know, what it was and what it was to be and essentially what killed it. Uh, a lot of questions out there. I know every now and then, uh, trans tech will pop up, you know, here we are 18 years later and, uh, you know, at least a couple times a year, I'll see the words trans tech pop up somewhere. And it, I've, it's my, it, it's been my experience that anything that is ever let loose becomes an infection almost. 
mm. and we can't get it out of our minds, whether it's the animated molds that never came out or, you know, the trans tech or, or whatever. It, once the, once it gets out into the ether, not even with the fans, it, it's an itch that never gets scratched. That's yeah. what's weird. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things like, you know, whenever it was announced and it never came out, put this in perspective. There are kids now that are alive that are driving age, have their driver's license, and possibly even married that weren't even out whenever Trans Tech was on the uh -huh. table. Sure. Uh, you know, but yet here we are so many years later and it's there's still people mentions it. And I thought it would be important for us as a podcast, you know, as, as, a, as a service to our fellow fans to talk about trans tech. Uh, you know, it's, it's gone but not forgotten. Uh, and a lot of people that's out there that might be just getting into the, uh, the fandom or, uh, you, know, they're, you know, they came on during the movies or some of these newer lines, they weren't aware of trans tech. What is trans tech? They may see the word trans tech mentioned uh, by older fans like uh, Don and myself. Um, you know, <laughs> you know they, they don't know what trans tech is. And I hope that we've kind of shed some light on it uh, today uh, with what is trans tech, what it was, and what it could have been. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of surprised, you know, with the designs they are out there now. You know, a lot of people, we've seen them. You know, we haven't. You know, we don't. Uh, I know people don't have access to the to the gray protos, but uh, you know, there's a company out there that took the design sketches for uh, some of the Beast Headmasters that were uh, that were never yeah. released in Japan that went ahead and made uh, made their own molds and put those out. You know, I'm surprised somebody hasn't done that with some of these Trans Tech designs. Honestly, yeah, I still want yeah. a Botanica. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The Botanica, the one figure that nobody ever got, and <laughs> it's like there's some people want her, some people don't. It it just would have been a neat concept to to try to to try to go from one form to the other. It's like based on, here on a design. plant, <laughs> right? Now you understand why we needed to get back to basics. Yes, yes. <laughs> I still want one though. <laughs> yeah. Well, you guys have any uh, closing thoughts, closing questions? Uh, um, I can't think of anything briefly, for Briefly, uh, yeah, just si since RID 1.0 was, was brought up a little bit ago, it, it reminded me of something I've, I've always kind of wondered uh, since, the, since the brand came out, and I've just, I've, I've just never really been too sure on it, but uh, the, the naming of a lot of these characters, uh, I've always kind of wondered with, with, <laughs> with Team Bullet Train, yeah, you got uh, Rail Spike, Rapid Run, yeah. and Rail Racer. Yeah. The you know yeah. all Midnight start Express, with cars. Uh, right? Midnight yeah. Express starts with an M, and I've always kind of felt that Midnight Express might have been more meant to be the name of the combiner, and the individuals would all start with R's. Uh, was, was that a thing, or what? What were the names again? Rapid Run, Rapid Run, Run Rail Spike, Rail, Spike, Rail Racer. Yeah. And Midnight Express. Yeah, you know, I I'm not going to disagree with you. That sounds like a better a better plan. My girlfriend at the time lived on Rapid Run Road in Cincinnati. Oh, oh okay. wow! <laughs> there you go. Cool. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. That's that's how names of Transformers are made. <laughs> I, I just kind of figured with with uh, with all the R's there that you know it would have made more sense the other way around. But. So if if you yeah live... no I think you're right. The combiner should have been. Yeah, Midnight Express. If you live in the Cincinnati area and you see the road named Rapid Run, know that there's a transformer named after that road. Yes. Right. And it's a we're, twisty, we're, windy road, too, so no train would be on it. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to have Transformers fans renting and buying homes on that road now. They're going to move there. <laughs> well, well, the well, problem is that it's R.I.D., and although R.I.D. has a ton of fans... It's like it's like I'm sure they would want to live on Optimus Prime Lane or Starscream Boulevard or you know places like we'll, that. We'll have to play. Uh, we'll have to play like character bingo some night where you guys just shoot characters at me and I just tell you some goofy story. Okay. Related, oh, 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 related to the 
to let's the development. Do or that real. Let's do that or, real quick. Let's just pick two characters. <laughs> uh, you know, Don, you pick one. Jim, you pick the other. No, it's got. Hey. It's got to be from Beast Wars on. I, I, okay. I, I don't. No, okay, go. I can tell you anything about the creation of okay. Cosmos. <laughs> Silverbolt from Beast Wars. Oh my goodness! I, I love Silverbolt. I love him. Uh, we're, we're just we're just picking a, a, a character that we want to see an update of. No, 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 just just facts about. That's that's a half tick too early for me. I had I had the pleasure okay. of working on the uh, Silver Bolt Tiger. What was that? Griffin? The Fuser. The fuser. Oh, Tiger Hawk? The big, yeah, no, it was a, kind of a bigger. Yeah, yeah. Well, had the well, wings. Yeah, okay, well, all right. Uh, I'll, let me pick a. Uh, okay, whose idea was it to give Silverbolt and Beast Machines a condor slash chicken? Where yeah. did that come from? Transformers the chicken. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. Uh, that wasn't that wasn't me. I, I, that that would have had to have been Takara. I think they were trying to make a Griffin or something okay. out of it at the time. Okay, that, that, I just was always wondering the where that uh, where that idea because he was. Yeah. Really but I I worked looking. on I worked on the little guys that were going to fit into the ball of that thing. Oh, um, yeah. that they didn't yeah. do. That we didn't do. I wish I still had the, 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 the sample of the one that Takara sent me. Okay, Jim. Who you got? Who you got? Oh, goodness. Um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, you know, t- Tidal Wave. Ooh. Tidal one. Wave. I've always said that's the only guy that I was requested to change the color of, and that's why the color of the show is different than the toy. And that's a pretty good track record if that's the only guy you had to change colors on per management. Um, Tidal Wave, Eric Siebenhaler knocked that guy out of the park. I, I, I uh, realized that after we talked about it not too long ago, my kid has that artwork, the package artwork, hanging in his room. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So I, 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 own, I bought package artwork along the way from some of the guys, Don and Marcelo and and all the uh, Guido and stuff at different points. So I own the Tidal Wave package art. There's oh, something. Sweet. Yeah. I've got three Botcon uh, line art, uh, the base line art here done by uh, uh, Don and uh, ink by uh, uh, Jake Eisenberg. I got yeah. uh, uh, Dion and uh, uh, Ferric and Shattered Glass Prime or oh, oh, no Ultra Magnus being on the wall. Oh, Mr. Skullhead. Yep. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. Let me throw one out there real quick. Uh, Classics Grimlock. Classics Grimlock. Yeah. Classics Grimlock. Well, uh, what can I say about that one? That was the first time we got to do something like that in a while. He, uh, I don't know if, was he successful? I don't know if he was that successful. Uh, he, I, I kind of like the Megatron dinosaur from Classics mm-hmm. more so than the Grimlock, as dinosaurs go. He was too blocky. Well, the cl- uh, the Classics Grimlock, uh, a lot of people uh, bashed it at first because... It's like, well, he doesn't have the Grimlock form, but then a lot of people realized um, that he was more like the Pretender Grimlock uh, mm-hmm. and homaged that more. Um, yeah. yeah, he's definitely homage to that. Yeah, just, just like Bumblebee with the uh, the Pretender be- or the actual um, fight back. Uh oh. What? What's that? Uh, his... I think it's Skype this time. The oh. is everybody. Yeah. Oh, there you go. You're back now. You just transformed into a buff- buffering circle and back. All, all, all we heard was what the hell, and then. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, Grimlock, uh, he doesn't suffer from the Godzilla thing as much as Krulock does. Um, all these little guys, they always we always ended up making them look a little too much like Godzilla, in my opinion. Yeah, he, he, not, he not, was not neat, but uh, he wasn't like the, the classic 
uh, you know, the you know how his Grimlock yeah. has a visual form that is identif- yeah, not identif- a- identifiable as Grimlock. He just didn't hit that. Yeah. It actually looks more Mecha Godzilla. Yep. Well, I think that'll do it for this episode of TFYP. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much again for joining us. No uh, your yes. your yeah, knowledge uh, knowledge of the brand is always valuable and still continues to be for this day. Yeah, so. And knowing is half the battle. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Thanks. No problem. <laughs> I got one of my got one of my March of the Robot drawings done while I was sitting. Uh, always stuff. looking at. I always love looking at those. When you post them awesome. online. Uh, f- so for uh, Jim Black, Headmaster Don, Aaron, thank you all once again for joining us. Uh, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash TFYLP. If you love what we do, uh, it helps us pay the server fees and upgrade equipment and everything. Uh, without your help, uh, TFYLP couldn't continue. So uh, check us out at patreon.com slash TFYLP. Uh, a quick note that if you are a top uh, the top tier subscriber on the uh, on the Patreon uh, for the future ones uh, here, uh, you will get an autographed copy of uh, Rick's new book, The Unofficial Guide to Vintage Transformers, uh, that I helped do the photography for. Um, you will get that as part of uh, your patron to this podcast. Uh, we thank everybody who continues to do that each and every month. Uh, it helps us a lot. Um, so check that out as always TFYLP, uh, on Twitter at TFYLP. It's the quickest way to get a hold of me. Uh, just drop a note and say, hi, I love the podcast. Love hearing from fans. Uh, so we'll t- uh, see you next time on TFYLP. Um, I don't know what next week's episode will be because that's two weeks from now <laughs> for me uh, as we record this uh, this this week was a, a challenge because I had to put two episodes together in one week not just one and uh, I think I think we did pretty well uh, and I thank Aaron for uh, uh, especially uh, for coming in at the 11th hour like yesterday I messaged him I'm like you know I'm I'm hitting a wall here can you help me out <laughs> and uh, I appreciate I love that. talking to the old the good old days I really appreciate it. Well, uh, thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time on TFYLP. Good night, everybody. Good night, all.